For those who don't know, Union Chapel is a well-known historic uh, congregational church uh, with a program working with people who are socially isolated um, and a very big program of art and music for which is probably best known. The Union Chapel is a congregationalist church with a long history going right back to to the 17th century and the English Civil War and uh, the formation of parliamentary democracy in the UK. So we have a, a strong interest in, in the issue of democracy. And a little while ago, I saw a tweet from Joshua Wong, um, who, who was basically complaining that churches weren't doing enough to, um, to support the people of Hong Kong, especially given that so many Christians are involved in that. And it struck me as being something that we at least could use our platform to be able to to help with um, and I sort of came across the the, the the connection with with the churches and I saw a demonstration and heard a hymn being sung singing hallelujah to the Lord and um, I used that for intercessions in one of our services when we were thinking about Hong Kong and then uh, a little bit later <coughs> we did a YouTube service uh, when things were really very difficult in Hong Kong and, and used that song. So um, that's why, you know, I, I wanted us to do this, um, having been inspired and having seen what's going on. But I'm not going to say any more. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Bethan, who is going to moderate. Bethan is, Bethan Lant is an, uh, a colleague, former colleague of mine for many years. Uh, she's uh, an activist in, in London uh, on all kinds of human rights issues, but especially uh, the issue of migration and uh, the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. She is somebody I admire enormously. She's got, I don't know, if you follow her on Twitter, she is one of the best tweeters there is. Um, she manages to combine activism with an incredible sense of humour, um, of which I'm very jealous. So Beth. Thank you. Now, if you don't all follow me on Twitter after that, I don't know what it's going to take. Um, welcome this evening to this talk. We're very lucky this evening to have some wonderful speakers with us, as Vaughan said. I'm going to moderate this evening. Um, Vaughan's already said a little bit about my background. I work for an organisation called Praxis in London, which works with refugees and migrants, but very much when they get to the UK, and hit all the kind of problems which our home office tend to stick people with when they finally think they've gotten out of this bad situation they were in in their own country and they end up dealing with the home office here who can be very, very bad. So as a result of that work, I tend to see lots of people from different parts of the world where there are problems and where there are ongoing issues. And sometimes you get so wrapped up with what's going on here in the UK when people get here, you don't stop to think enough about, well, what is it that's going on back in wherever it is that someone comes from, which has caused this, this flow of people to come here. So it's always good to take a step back from my day-to-day -day work and to take a look at some of what's going on around the world, which is causing flows of people, which is causing people to leave countries of origin and find out what the issues are there and what's going on. I'm also part of a church in East London, an Anglo-Catholic church, uh, which is based on Cable Street in East London. For people who know any history of the UK and um, some of its political history, Cable Street was a very important venue in one of the big fights against fascism back in the 1930s. And we take a great pride in that history in this area and very much feel that we should continue to fight against fascism. We're an area of London which has a large migrant population and um, those of us in churches here feel very strongly about standing in solidarity with migrants and with other people across the world who are facing 
problems, particularly in their own battles for democracy and against fascism. So I think that's probably a little bit about why tonight is important to me in particular. As I said, we have um, some wonderful speakers here this evening. I'm not going to give them huge introductions because they're, you've already seen their biographies which have been circulated, but I'm sure they'll all tell you a little bit about their background and about why they have been asked to speak here tonight. So we have three speakers to start with. We're going to then have an opportunity for some questions and some discussion. And then the final speaker um, will uh, give um, his little bit and then we'll have a bit of a roundup. So to begin with, we will have Rae Wong, who is um, the founder of the Hong Kong Indigenous Party. Then we will move on to Samuel Cho, who is the um, founder of the Hong Kong Democratic Council in the US. And that will be followed by Benedict Rogers, the founding CEO of Hong Kong Watch. So um, these three speakers will um, tell you a little bit about them. We'll have a space for questions. If you do have any questions you want to ask, please type them in the Q&A box. If they're addressed to any particular speaker, please make that clear when you type the question. I will keep an eye on that. And then when we come to the space for questions, I'll put the questions to um, our speakers. After that, we will then have Krish Kandia, who will talk a little bit um, about what can be done. Um, Krish is the founder of Home for Good, so he's going to talk a little bit about information on support for refugees. So, without further ado, um, let me hand over to Ray, who is going to start our evening for us. Ray. Thank you, Beth, and thank you for your introduction. And it's my honor to speak here. Thank you for inviting me. So as Beth uh, introduced, I am Ray Wan, and currently I am living in Germany. And actually, I'm not sure if I have a chance to go back to Hong Kong because I am a refugee here in Germany. So how come I have been a refugee. Actually, I'm the first ever refugee from Hong Kong in Europe. Everything actually began in today, six years ago, from the beginning of Umbrella Revolutions, because um, the Umbrella Revolution is a very significant movement, social movement in Hong Kong. Before the Umbrella Revolution, I and a lot of young people, we didn't see any means, any ways to pressurize the government, to hoping that government would listen to us and uh, to uh, respond to our demands. But the Umbrella Revolution, on the first date, we saw a lot of Hong Kong people, even though the, the, those organizers and those main leaders asked uh, participants to leave due to the police violence. But Hong Kong people insisted to occupy uh, the, on the streets and we didn't give up. So at that time, this date gave me hope that we Hong Kong people can finally um, uh, have enough power and we know how to pressurize the government. And after the Umbrella Revolution, I founded a political party, which is called Hong Kong Indigenous. Our main objective is to use a more proactive means to uh, protest. And what we fight for is, of course, democracy, freedom, and rule of law. As we can see that the, all the values which promised by the basic law have been deteriorating since the hangover 1997. And as uh, young people, we are very concerned of the, about the future of Hong Kong and our values. So after funding the Hong Kong Indigenous Party, um, we initially organized protests uh, addressing issue related to um, Chinese people and related to Chinese, uh, in particular, in related to Chinese smugglers who um, made use of the 
uh, unlimited visa issued by the Chinese government to come to Hong Kong to buy all the necessities uh, in the areas which are close to the Chinese border. And actually this problem existed for a very long time, but the Hong Kong government didn't really listen to people. And what they said uh, is, as keep asking people to be tolerant to uh, Chinese people because we Hong Kong people have black hair, yellow skin, and black puppies. So we are all Chinese people. We should tolerate them. And uh, as young people, we think differently. So we initiate um, a, a campaign addressing this issue, and turns out the Shenzhen government abolished the policy of unlimited visa and changing this policy to be a one week, uh, one time visa, which drastically changes the whole situation in uh, the community near the Chinese border. So we um, gain some confidence in all these protests. And then we started to um, run for elections. And one of our, can uh, our candidates, Edward Learn, actually now he is uh, in prison serving um, um, for, for six years. And we ran for the by-elections and we gained 15% of votes in that um, election. Actually, this result already promised us to win at least two seats in the uh, general elections. But then the Chinese government and the Hong Kong government um, disqualified our candidates and banned Edward Learn from running the elections. So we had no way to fight for what we values within the system because we have no way to get into the, um, the, the parliament to voice out, to, um, uh, um, to debate and to discuss uh, the issue we concern. So we, but still we at that time thought that it's very crucial for uh, the voice of young people to get into the parliament. So uh, my party, Hong Kong Indigenous, supported another party, Young Spirations, in the general election, and they won two seats. And yeah, most of the, the member, and including I, me, myself, became the uh, assistant of the lawmaker. But it also didn't last very long, just two months. After two months, the Hong Kong government, the chief executive at that time, uh, sued our two lawmakers. And then the court um, 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 announced that the um, off taken by our lawmaker is not validated, and whereby two of our lawmakers um, got disqualified and so um, not only uh, banning us from running the election and getting into the parliament, I was in Hong Kong charged with three charges. One is the uh, as inciting uh, a riot, participating in the riot and inciting an illegal assembly. These three charges can um, uh, sent me to prison up to maximum 10 years. And this is the reason why now I'm in Germany. Um, um, so, but at the time after the Umbrella Revolution and uh, all of our protests, actually there had no concerns amongst the uh, pro-democratic uh, protesters as to whether we should uh, stick to the um, uh, non-violence doctrines to protest or we should change our tactics to be more proactive or sometimes maybe um, um, would be called as violence. Um, at that time, 
I, why I was charged with inciting riots is because of one of our um, protests happened in 2016 February during the Chinese um, uh, New Year. That protest turned out to be um, a bit uh, violent. Protester uh, uh, had conflicts with a uh, police officer and about um, 100 police officers got injured uh, by a uh, protester at that time. And we were accused not only uh, by, the, by the Chinese government as uh, radical separatists. And at that time, uh, some traditional pandemic politicians condemn us as uh, by saying that we they don't agree with all the violence means and we are not part of the uh, uh, democracy movement actually this move upset a lot of young people we i think no one would sincerely support violence and i myself i was also a peaceful protester but what changed our mind is that when we look at our government, when we look at our enemy, do they really listen to people? If is peaceful protest can really effective to pressurize them? No, we can see it from the umbrella revolutions at that time during the the whole seventy nine days. Protests uh, were largely peaceful, but. The government didn't listen, didn't listen to us. There was another great example showing the mentality of the Hong Kong government is that on the 9th of June last year, there were about 1 million Hong Kong people on the streets protesting against the extradition law. And that, that protest was completely peaceful. But what the Hong Kong government said in the same night was that even though mo there were 1 million Hong Kong people ex peacefully expressing their voice, but the um, extradition law will still um, get into the legislation process. This statement really angered a lot of Hong Kong people. And it already shows that peaceful protests cannot really effectively pressurize the government. We don't want violence, but we have to use force to stop violence. Force is justified, legitimate force, but violence is illegitimate. The Hong Kong government is making use of the, all the advantages to um, um, override the will of Hong Kong people. This is our only way to make the government listen to us. And so uh, um, due to the previous experience uh, from the umbrella revolution and the fishbowl revolution organized by my party, um, Hong Kong people have learned from these two lessons. We developed three mottos in the anti-extradition law movement. The first one is um, uh, no split, um, which means even though some uh, protesters don't really agree with the, what other protesters uh, did, but we won't split, we won't divide, we won't condemn other people. And the second motto is uh, leaderless because we have learned from the umbrella revolution and all the uh, other movements that the, all, the, all the leaders would easily get, uh, get arrested and be aimed by the government and police. So if uh, every individual protester um, um, uh, only follow the instructions of leader. Then once the leader got arrested, got detained, then the movement will uh, be dissolved. So uh, this is the tactics and uh, uh, strategies 
the current pro uh, the protested currently using in the anti extradition law movement. So maybe later on we will um, talk more about uh, the current situation and what uh, and the situation now uh, uh, in in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. That's really good to hear what's going on on the ground and get more insight into that and exactly what's going on there. That's really, really interesting stuff. So, Samuel, I'm going to hand over to you now and let you um, tell us a little bit more about what's going on. So, uh, thank you, and, and it's a pleasure to, to join this group and, and to be speaking alongside of uh, Ray and, and Ben and others uh, who have been in this fight together uh, for, for many years. Um, uh, my name is Samuel Chu, as, as Bethan said, uh, I'm the uh, founding and the managing director for Hong Kong Democracy Council, the HKDC. Uh, we're the first and only DC-based um, nonpartisan nonprofit that uh, dedicated uh, to uh, the issue of Hong Kong uh, and to preserving and protecting its autonomy and basic freedom. Um, and I, I let me... Um, I think Ray has already gone into some of the history. Um, let me just uh, focus on a couple uh, points specifically around, um, I think, what the intersections around um, faith and spirituality and, and, and the movement um, as it relates to both my personal story, but also the story of HADC, which represents uh, many of the Hong Kongers who lives in the U.S. and uh, who are temporarily or permanently here uh, as citizens or residents or students. Um, I think it's important that um, people look at the current events in the context of history. Um, I was um, there, uh, as Ray described, I was there five years ago, actually, on this day, uh, on the street in Hong Kong. Uh, my father, uh, the Reverend Chu Yuming, uh, and uh, Benny Tai and Chen Gaiman were their three uh, co-founders of Occupy Central, which really was a not a faith-based necessarily. It was a civil disobedient campaign that was really infused with much of the uh, spiritual and, and Christian values that all three of the co-founders uh, held deeply personally, and, and and but it was about translating that into a form of mass civil disobedience, um, and but I think it's important to look at it. And, and Benny, who was interviewed yesterday by one of the Hong Kong newspaper, described it in this way. He said that it, it's kind of like four different movement, uh, sort of in a, in a continuum of. It began in 1989 in the student protest in Tiananmen Square, and then the supportive movement that happened and unfolded in Hong Kong. Uh, so just as a, a side note, I know that um, when we're on Zoom, I have the benefit that Ray and I look about the same age on Zoom, which is great. Um, it turns out that I'm actually a generation older than, than Ray, so I was actually alive and, and, and also um, I, I remember 89. I was actually, uh, as a young uh, 11, 10, 11 year old, uh, attended the first ever um, million people march in 89, in May of 89 uh, in Hong Kong in support of the movement in, in, in Beijing and Tiananmen Square. Um, and so I think it's important to look at the trace to, you know, that was really the first movement and then I think that you see this um, second wave of the handover and then sort of the subsequent sort of initial years of fighting back of, you know, yet last year was not the first time that the Hong Kong authorities and Chinese authority have tried to implement a national security law. They tried to do that early on in 2003. Um, there was a huge backlash and half a million people took to the street in 2003 and beat back that version of the national security law. And then you fast forward to five years ago, that really was a third movement of this, you know, if we can't go with the promises and the timeline and the, pro, you know, guarantees that are under the joint declaration and the basic law, we have to shift. protests, but deliberate civil disobedience uh, in trying to make our case. Um, and I think Ray described part of the, the, the mix, you know, fallout from that of, of both having this idea of, you know, the, the major 
uh, leaders being arrested and sort of taking some of the directions and, and momentum away, not having won any real concession as a part of that uh, piece of civil disobedience. And then I think that that's what led to, I think, this ongoing now fourth wave of, um, I think, this rapid escalation of people realizing that there is now a complete detachment of Hong Kong government being in any sort of way responsible or responsive and being held accountable to the well-being and interests of Hong Kongers versus being essentially just a puppet uh, for the Beijing authorities. And, and in a lot of ways, I, and, and, I mean, Ben and others might also add into this, but really just as the leverage to control the rest of China uh, because Hong Kong represent this spot, this place of resistance, this global platform of resistance that I think threatens the kind of complete total control that China needs. And so um, in a lot of ways, um, you know, they're facing, um, you know, we're facing as a movement, not just a crackdown to Hong Kong, but the rest of China is on the line here uh, if Hong Kong does not get um, uh, squash uh, the way that the, I think the CCP would like it to. But I think it's important because that's actually my story as well. And I think that that's part of where I think, um, you know, uh, today, you know, it would be, I would be remiss to, to not mention, uh, I spent a lot of time in, in the last decade uh, working and, and serving with uh, the Jewish community as, as Yom Kippur today. Uh, I was actually in services right before this uh, online because we're not now doing spiritual uh, religious services online um, and you know there's a, a, an idea to uh, the ritual the liturgical and, and this idea of the practice of coming back to the same story narrative and um, rituals year after year using the same words because it infused a kind of traditions and power and I think that that's what is so important about the movement in Hong Kong is that it's not just a spontaneous one-off. It didn't just start one day last June. It didn't start five years ago today. It started into this ritual. And Hong Kongers are uniquely wired to be able to stand up authoritarianism in the past 14 months because they have been practicing annually, sometimes monthly, uh, you know, people forget that for 30 some years, Hong Kong was the only piece of place in China that were allowed to memorialize this massacre of June 4th in Tiananmen Square. And I think that there's something profoundly important about that ritualizing that keeps a people like the people of Hong Kong unfazed and unchanged and unwilling to compromise because they have been remembering, they have been resisting, they have been telling those story day after day and year after year. And that really, for me, is my, my story. As I said, I was there. Um, my um, father, who uh, started the Hong Kong Alliance, which became sort of the, the large uh, Hong Kong organization that supported the Tiananmen Square protests, uh, as it has since become news many years later, my father also um, helped build the Underground Railroad that smuggled all the dissidents who escaped from the square and, um, and resettled them to Western countries. Um, you know, I grew up in the midst of that and, and, and part of, you know, between going to protests in 89 as an 11 year old and then spending weekends in the safe houses with these dissidents who are waiting for their papers to go to France or UK or the US. Uh, that's the kind of uh, formation that I think is so important in both our congregations and spiritual communities, but also in protest movement over time. Um, you know, I think we all probably have heard, you know, different version of the saying about, you know, people always ask, you know, why do you go protest uh, if it doesn't work? Right, you show up every time and, and nobody actually does anything or concede anything or uh, you don't win anything that day. And, and I think that our spiritual tradition sometimes helps us to inform us that going out week after week, day after day, year after year, 
is not just about changing the external, but it's also making sure that you don't get corrupt in the process. Right? It is about as much about us becoming the person in the community that we need to be in the face of oppressions, as much as it is about that day being able to win something, you know, concrete on the day of. And so I think that those are some of the things for me. I mean, um, as I said, I was there uh, in 2014. I was there last year in the beginning of the anti-extraditions. Um, and, and I think that to be able to uh, weave together the, the, the movement in its development and the various people, um, it's, it's an incredibly important part of the spirituality of protest. When my father and the eight others were uh, went to jail, and 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 I think uh, Ray talked about many of the leaders and organizers were charged and arrested. Um, in a way, um, we saw that trial last you know last year in April uh, as being a platform to evangelize about the protest movement. Right here is the government doing us a favor to allow us to put on a case for two weeks publicly to state and explain from beginning to end the reasoning, the value, the process, and the unfolding of the umbrella movement five years ago. And, and people, I think, cease to this idea of um, there's something to be said about uh, the way we tell our stories. And, and I think that that has been so remarkable around what has been taking place in Hong Kong over the last 30 years. Now, I'm going to be very honest, that also brings up then the point that I think um, Vaughn uh, brought up in the beginning that Joshua recently tweeted about. That, I think, that whole, I think, um, movement and the current, the spirituality and I think the, 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 the faith aspect of the movement that has been undergirding uh, the, 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 the Hong Kong protest movement, actually it's, it's reveals to us how insufficient and how um, really inactive the actual church community has been in Hong Kong, right? Um, you know, I, I, my father who for many years was one of the only uh, person and leaders of faith who uh, combined and really took his faith traditions as a, uh, you know, the banner in which he participated politically and, and socially and in the protests. Um, you know, and you can count for many years just in the one hand, you know, with, with Cardinal Zen, who uh, is now retired and continues to be a vocal uh, leaders, but they were very much individuals who took the risk uh, and quite a bit of attacks and backlash from the faith community to say that, you know, we're not really comfortable with this combining of politics and, and religion. And because of that, I think you see the, the, the really glaring weakness of the churches in Hong Kong being co-opted. Today, you might not be able to go out as a congregation to join the protest, but you get to vote as part of a function, a functional constituency to be part of the selection committee for the chief executive that is not selected democratically. And, and what you see is that um, the shying away and the, the unwillingness to really put their faith to the test politically has given them, essentially put them in a place where they're now co-opted in a lot of ways, uh, through years of protest, when Hong Kongers in general, outside of the church, and even many members of the church are themselves practicing resistance and this idea of subversiveness, the church institution itself was actually being co-opted by the state. But I think you're seeing some of that shift now. Um, I think the last 14 months, 15 months have seen more of the outspoken, not just individual who's saying, I'm putting that outside my hat as a minister or as a pastor. They're saying that I am coming as part of my community, risking being, you know, 
ex, you know, sort of exiled or being, you know, uh, complained and, and have my own church members, um, you know, call me out to be able to actually stand in favor. And I think that, you know, Juan described those scenes of ministers and clergy singing uh, in the midst of very tense moments. I think that it's important to see those as being um, Christian community. I think that that's, for me, it's just the very beginning of the churches becoming uh, aware of how far they have fallen behind uh, of the struggle of the people. So I'm going to stop there. And, and, and um, I, I think that um, for me, um, the, the last 15 months has it, it's, it's been both a call to challenge uh, for the churches in Hong Kong. And also, I think it has been an opportunity for us to um, really think about what it means to reform these institutions like churches while we're still on the street fighting, uh, because there will not be a, um, I think, a, a sustainable long-term protest movement on the street unless some of these institutions like churches and schools continue to become more democratic, to become much more subversive, to become much more politically courageous um, in professing his faith um, and, and not to uh, abstain from the role that they must play. So I'll stop there and happy to answer more questions later. Thank you, Samuel. That's really, really great. I was wondering when, before you started speaking about whether the movement traced its roots back to Tiananmen Square and, and, and what you drew from that. I think you've answered that, which is really great. And you, you're definitely speaking to the Catholic in me when you talk about ritual and liturgy. I'm there going, yeah, that's good stuff. I like that. So anyway, I'll hand over to Ben now. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying it's a great privilege to, to share this uh, panel with um, all the other speakers and, and a big thank you to, to Union Chapel for initiating and, and hosting this. Um, and I think it's really significant. I wish we could say that we chose it deliberately. I, I'm not sure that we can say that, but it's really significant that this, uh, two things about this date. Uh, the first is that this event is taking place. Uh, as has been said, on this anniversary uh, of the Umbrella Movement. Uh, and the second, speaking very personally, um, is that uh, today is actually my first day in my new job uh, as the full-time chief executive of Hong Kong Watch. I, I co-founded Hong Kong Watch three years ago, uh, and um, I feel like I've been full-time for the last three years, but actually uh, I was the chair of the trustees and 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 working entirely in my spare time until, until today. So um, I, I'm pleased to mark my first day in the job, both by remembering this significant anniversary six years ago and, and by taking part in this important event. Um, perhaps what I can do is just give you some very brief background to, to sort of where I'm coming from, um, and then say a bit about um, how I see things in terms of international advocacy uh, here in the UK and, and around the world. Um, on Hong Kong and what, what more uh, we can do uh, from an advocacy perspective. Um, I uh, uh, first went to China when I was 18 years old in my year between sc school and university and um, spent six months teaching English in the city of Qingdao. And that's really how I got involved with um, a lifelong uh, 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 love of of. China and Hong Kong, uh, and I'm always very keen to distinguish between uh, a love of China and the people of China uh, and my criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. The, the, the regime in Beijing will describe people like me as being anti-China, but on the contrary, uh, I do what I do because I want all the people of China, as, as Samuel's already outlined, those who struggled so courageously at Tiananmen, uh, I, I want the people of China to be free and to enjoy uh, the, the rights uh, uh, that we in this country take for granted. Um, I, after uh, university, my very first job uh, was in Hong Kong, and I, I moved to Hong Kong in September 1997, just a couple of months after the handover, and began my working 
uh, life as a journalist uh, in Hong Kong, lived there for the first five years after the handover until 2002. And I think one of the things that, um, one of the reasons that Hong Kong is, matters so much to me personally is not just the fact that I began my career there, I loved living there, um, and I worked as a journalist there, and at that time, uh, the press was basically pretty free, and of course now, press freedom, I think, is, uh, is coming under increasing uh, attack. But also, in my, again, in my spare time whilst living in Hong Kong, um, I started a, a, a branch of the organization that I've been working with uh, for the last many years, uh, a human rights organization called CSW, Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Uh, and uh, from Hong Kong, um, I uh, really grew in my human rights work, but defending human rights issues, highlighting human rights issues in the rest of the region. So at the time that I lived in Hong Kong, Hong Kong was a hub, not just an international financial hub, but actually a, a hub for freedom in the rest of the region. And I was uh, spent almost all my uh, spare time speaking to churches in Hong Kong uh, about the situation in, in Myanmar, uh, in uh, North Korea. Um, I took uh, groups from churches in Hong Kong to both East Timor uh, and the refugee camps on the Thailand-Myanmar border. Uh, I even led demonstrations in Hong Kong for East Timor at the time of the uh, conflict uh, there. And it never occurred to me when I left Hong Kong in 2002 that um, the time would come when I'd be speaking in demonstrations for Hong Kong um, uh, in, in, in London. Um, when I left in 2002, I, I, and from 2002 until the Umbrella Movement, I would have to say that I largely lost contact with the uh, political situation in Hong Kong, really because, at least on the surface, uh, one country, two systems during those years was working reasonably well. I, I left thinking things in Hong Kong were okay, uh, and I, my focus was on other, those other issues uh, elsewhere in the region, including in mainland China itself. But the umbrella movement six years ago was a turning point for me personally, I uh, followed it closely, realized that something very significant uh, was changing in Hong Kong uh, and started to re-engage with the issues. Um, from 2014 to 2017, uh, I was doing that um, purely in an individual, personal, uh, again, spare time capacity, um, writing uh, some op-eds, um, uh, uh, talking to MPs uh, where I could, um, uh, and somehow, I'm not quite sure how it happened, but I ended up um, uh, being being asked by people in Hong Kong when they came to London to arrange uh, advocacy uh, meetings for them. So when Nathan Law, who's now, of course, the most high profile uh, exile who, who uh, escaped from Hong Kong on July the 1st, just after the national security law was imposed, uh, he came to London in 2016 just after he'd been elected the youngest uh, member of the Legislative Council. And uh, I met Nathan and um, took him around Parliament, um, introduced him to, among others, uh, Lord Alton, uh, who is one of our patrons of Hong Kong Watch now. Um, and Lord Alton had, had once, back in the 1970s, been elected to the House of Commons as the youngest member of Parliament. And when he met Nathan, he said, well, I was once what we call uh, the baby of the house. And he said, us, us babies of the house need to stick together. Um, and uh, then Joshua Wong came to London and I, I helped uh, arrange meetings for him. Um, and then in the summer of 2017, uh, Anson Chan, the former chief secretary of the Hong Kong government, but who went on to be one of the most prominent uh, voices for democracy from sort of the older generation, came to London and, and I met her and I, I assumed because of who she was that she would have her own meetings and I asked uh, who are you meeting in London and uh, of the handover and so at very short notice I was able to in, to arrange some some quite uh, key high level meetings for her but I thought to myself, this is, this is ridiculous that uh, someone like her is relying on uh, someone like me uh, doing this in my spare time. It happened by good fortune that I was in London. I could easily have been 
traveling. And I thought, this isn't sustainable. We need a, an organization that can, uh, can, can, can do this uh, more systematically. And also I was very struck at that time by how uh, low the level of awareness among the MPs that we were meeting was uh, about the situation in Hong Kong. It's changed a lot now because of events in Hong Kong, people are more aware. But back then in, in 2017, um, very few MPs were really properly informed. And so um, I started thinking about it. I came together with, with others. Um, I then actually was uh, in um, Indonesia for work and um, uh, was sitting in a traffic jam in Surabaya. And if any of you know uh, Indonesia at all, you'll know that um, a, an Indonesian traffic jam gives you a lot of thinking time. Um, and so I was sat, sat in the back of this taxi and I thought, um, okay, we need, we need to start Hong Kong Watch. And I messaged a few friends in London and uh, that's how uh, the organization was, uh, was born. Um, there was another aspect to the events at that time that coincided with that, which was that um, as I sat in that traffic jam in Indonesia, I knew that uh, Joshua Wong, Nathan Law and Alex Chow were just days away from uh, being jailed. Their, their trial was, was happening at that time. Uh, and uh, I, when they were jailed, I helped to organize a, uh, an international uh, statement. Um, I found myself, when I heard their jail sentence, thinking by that point I was actually on a few days holiday. Um, and I found myself thinking, well, it's outrageous that they've been jailed. Somebody should do something. Somebody should organize uh, a statement signed by um, you know, politicians and dignitaries. And then it suddenly dawned on me that maybe that somebody was, was me. Um, and so I, I did. And uh, it, it all grew from there. Um, a couple, but then my... just two months after I'd had that idea for Hong Kong Watch, I decided to visit Hong Kong because I, I hadn't been for a couple of years. I thought it was important to go and talk to people on the ground. And, um, but unfortunately, Beijing had other ideas and uh, didn't um, uh, want me to, to go. And I was um, denied entry uh, to Hong Kong in, in October 2017. Um, I believe I was possibly the, the first uh, Western activist uh, to be denied entry. Sadly, there's been a long line of people since me, including um, the head of Human Rights Watch, Ken Roth, the um, Financial Times Asia uh, uh, editor who was based in Hong Kong being uh, thrown out, uh, Vic Victor Mallet, uh, and quite a number of others. And of course, although my, my incident then actually helped draw a certain amount of attention uh, to the situation at that time, I wouldn't have chosen for that to happen, but once it did happen, I was glad it, it did ha help put a spotlight on Hong Kong. Obviously, since then, the situation has, uh, has deteriorated uh, so much more um, seriously. Um, let me turn very briefly to um, what uh, we can do in terms of advocacy. Um, I think that uh, in the last few months, because of the dramatic deterioration in the situation and the imposition of the national security law, we have finally seen uh, some, some really concrete actions by the British government and, and others uh, that um, have been a long time coming. I personally wish that the British government and other governments had taken a stronger stand earlier on, and perhaps if they had done uh, we might not be where we are today, but um, nevertheless, be better late than never. And so um, the British government's most significant move, of course, was um, uh, as soon as the national security law was imposed on Hong Kong, they announced their offer to um, potentially up to 3 million British national overseas uh, uh, status uh, holders in Hong Kong, uh, that they could come to the UK, uh, that they would be a, a pathway to citizenship, uh, and that this, this lifeline for BNO passport holders was, um, was there. And that's hugely welcome. I think it's a, a very, it's an unprecedented uh, and very generous uh, offer. There are, of course, issues around the detail that still need to be worked out. And one of our roles in Hong Kong Watch is, is to advocate and, and lobby um, on that. But we very much support uh, the principle. Um, 
But we have three main um, strands of, of advocacy now. I mean, a number of other issues besides, but broadly advocating a three-pronged approach. Um, the first is that we, we believe that um, it's really vital for um, the free world as a whole, um, Britain, the United States, uh, our European friends, uh, Australia and, and, and others in the region, uh, to um, coordinate uh, a, um, a punitive response. Uh, and by punitive, what I mean is, is targeted sanctions. Uh, I don't advocate sanctions uh, against China as a whole or Hong Kong as a whole, or certainly not uh, the people of China or Hong Kong, um, but sanctions against uh, officials in Beijing and Hong Kong who are responsible for uh, serious human rights violations uh, and for breaching an international treaty and, and perhaps also sanctions on uh, specific entities that are um, closely uh, part of the Chinese Communist Party that, um, that also bear some responsibility. Um, secondly, a diplomatic uh, approach, and in particular, the creation of um, a, a UN uh, mechanism to uh, address the situation. Um, we were, I think, one of the first organizations to call for the creation of uh, a um, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Hong Kong um, and also a UN Special Envoy. Um, uh, and we can, if people want to come back to those specific issues in, in the Q&A, I can say more about them. Um, but we, we were able to mobilize support from a wide range of, of uh, uh, key figures in the international community, including um, uh, a number of former UN Special Rapporteurs uh, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, uh, uh, and uh, in the end, actually 50 serving uh, UN rapporteurs. Uh, and then the third strand to our advocacy is advocating a what we call a lifeboat uh, rescue scheme, because although the BNO offer is very uh, significant, um, there are so many uh, young uh, activists uh, in Hong Kong who don't qualify for BNO because they were born after 1997, and in many ways, they're the most vulnerable. Um, so those are our, our three um, strands of, of advocacy, and we're, we're carrying that advocacy out not only here in the UK, but uh, in the EU, um, together with Samuel in, in the US uh, and, and, and elsewhere, Canada and, and beyond. So let me um, close just by saying, why does all this matter to Britain? And I think essentially there are two basic reasons, no, three basic reasons. The first is um, we have a legal responsibility through the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Secondly, of course, we have a moral responsibility given our history. And thirdly, I think that there's a matter of self-interest as well, because Hong Kong is basically uh, the, the new front line in the fight for freedom. Um, this is not just a battle for the rights and freedoms of Hong Kongers. It's a battle for freedom uh, against uh, tyranny and repression. And if Hong Kong, if, if the Chinese regime is allowed to get away with what they've done to Hong Kong, um, then Taiwan will be next, uh, and we ourselves uh, could well be next. So I think it's uh, both morally right, but in our, in our interest as well, to stand with Hong Kong, to welcome Hong Kongers who come here, and we can come back to that uh, in the Q&A, um, but to continue also to fight for Hong Kong to not have to be in a place where people need to flee, because that people fleeing should be the last resort, not the first response. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. That's really good to hear all of that. It's, it's interesting to hear one of the few positive things that can be ascribed to a traffic jam. <laughs> it's really nice to know that there's something good that comes out of all of those traffic jams. So that's good. Um, it's been fascinating to hear you all speaking from the different angles. We've had some questions coming up both through the chat and through the Q&A um, question box. So I'm going to um, just put a few of those questions. Um, we have um, a question which was specifically to Ray from John Weir, which was about why you sought refuge in Germany. Was there anything in particular about Germany? How did you end up there as opposed to anywhere else? Well, actually, back uh, to that time in 2017, I was actually thinking um, U.S. or U.K. or Germany. But at that time, the U.K. and U.S. still had a pretty good relations with China. So I was afraid that maybe they might deport me back to Hong Kong. 
But Germany, yes, of course, uh, Germany till now still has a pretty good relations with China and has been pretty reserved on Hong Kong issue. But um, since long, they have been very outspoken in human rights situations in China. So um, I was uh, pretty uh, certain that um, in Germany, I can get refugees uh, status. That's right. I went to Germany, and I, I, to be honest, if at that time I had a choice, I had had a choice to go to the UK, and I uh, know that um, the UK might grant asylum to me. I might have been to the UK because. Trust me, learning German is not a fun thing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I remember my school days. I never did much with German either. Never mind. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have a question from Teresa Norman, which was um, initially to Ray, but I think um, all the panelists could potentially ask it. It's about, you know, when we do these things, when you choose to act in the face of these things, is it about courage or necessity? What is it which makes you act in these kind of things where there's, there's so much power on one side and you must feel very vulnerable um, at times? So if anyone who'd like to enter on that one. So, um, I, I mean, I can jump in and uh, I, I uh, so, you know, we all have our um, uh, sort of claim uh, in a way, uh, unfortunate claim to fame. You know, Ray is the first um, European Hong Kong refugees. Uh, ben was the first foreign activist that was banned from entry. Uh, and a month and a half ago, I became the first uh, foreign citizen to be char uh, to have an arrest warrant uh, issued. Uh, under the national security law and and so I, I i'm not sure and i won't speak for ben and ray i'm not sure if um you know the simple narrative of courage is sort of the 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 the, the easiest answer i i think i describe it i think for me is um this is for me why i think faith traditions and faith communities present such a unique you know um, meaningful backdrop to this is that i think it is a mix of um the the values and traditions that we inherit uh, from our, uh, you know, ancestor to our parents, to our faith traditions, the relationship that uh, we hold uh, to be valuable. And, and I think that, you know, I always think of it as, again, um, we all, and I think Ben particularly have, have always uh, focused on, uh, on this, is uh, there's something about our own uh, commitment to truth. Um, and uh, that is both in our religious traditions, but also to our personal values. I think it's become a way, and, and I, I see this as being an obligation to, if we are um, committed to seeking the truth, to speaking the truth, to uh, living out the truth, uh, these are the obligations and these are the circumstances we find ourselves in. And, and so, our, you know, in, in my case, obviously people ask me, you know, what does it feel like to not be able to return to Hong Kong? Um, you know. I count it as fortunate because my family and I, for our two generation, have had the choice to decide that this is what we are willing to risk uh, for speaking the truth and for acting out in, in, in truth. And uh, 7.5 million Hong Kongers, many of them never got a choice uh, and they're now living under this uh, regime. Um, and, and so I, I see this as, as I think, a, 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 both the value, the relationship, but also I think this, um, you know, idea. And, and that's how we uh, came to, you know, continue this work in advocacy in the U.S. and, and uh, as, as Ben has done in, in the U.K. Yeah, lovely. Would Ray or Ben, would either of you like to come in on this one at all? Um, I was, oh, Ray, please, after you, I was holding back for you. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I think, actually, both uh, are right. I had no choice, but at the same time, it also requires a lot of courage. Uh, why I said I had no choice is because when, as a Hong Kong person who uh, was grown up and was immersed in all this uh, values such as democracy, freedom. When I see the situation where all this value will be destroyed, 
I I had no choice, but my heart urges me to act, to do something. But it, yes, indeed, it always takes courage to follow your heart. It always takes courage to um, do what is right. So yeah, this is my story. Um, j just briefly, I mean, I agree very much with with Ray and Samuel. I, I certainly would never um, claim uh, courage for myself, especially by comparison with people like Ray and Samuel and, and people in Hong Kong. You know, what, what I've faced is, is nothing uh, by comparison. Um, but I think that there's, um, I, I think I, I've always believed very strongly that um, those of us who who have the privilege of freedom and whose freedom is pretty secure. I mean, I, we have our challenges in this country, but, but essentially we still have our freedoms um, uh, that we should use that freedom uh, on behalf of those who either don't have freedom or whose freedom is, is threatened. Um, uh, having worked for many years on, on Myanmar, um, the famous words of, of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, uh, please use your freedom uh, to defend ours um, have always stayed with me. Uh, and I think also there's something, um, for me at least, um, something counterproductive about the way the Chinese regime behaves. When they denied me entry to Hong Kong, it didn't have the desired effect of, of silencing me. It just made me more determined to, to speak up for the city that had once been my home and that, like Samuel and Ray, I can no longer go to. Um, I've also had... Um, uh, a number of sort of threatening letters that have come to my home, my neighbor's home, my, even my mother has received uh, uh, letters telling her uh, to tell her son to, uh, to shut up. But thankfully, my, my mother's wonderful, and she said I gave up trying that you know, years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and the effect of these letters was just, I mean, I guess there's something about the Chinese regime is, is a bully. And, and what do you, what's the right approach to a bully? Do you stand up to them? And, uh, and, and, and carry on, or do you, you know, give up and, and, and uh, retreat in, in fear? And I think, um, for me, it, it has to be the former, particularly when the risks that I face are, are, are really minimal by comparison. Thank you. Beautiful answer from all of you on that. We've had a question, I think, which has been partially answered um, in the chat, but Richard Sue had been asking about what's the best way for churches in the UK to support what's going on in Hong Kong, particularly if churches in Hong Kong are not really asking for solidarity and may not be used to operating in that manner. Um, I mean, well, I, I think I can, um, and Ben can probably better equip to speak to the specific, but I actually think of a couple of things that comes to mind, and this is the same case in the U.S. as it is in the U.K. I think it is incredibly important for churches to, A, just to demonstrate their proactive role in social justice and, and, and equality and human rights broadly anywhere to serve as a model of what it looks like for religious congregation to take a stand publicly. Um, and you know, and, and this is not limited to just issue in Hong Kong and what has happening in China, but just in general, because I think that the role model that that plays for Hong Kong churches, I think is important. Um, secondly, I think that uh, there are, I think um, specifically uh, ways in which that, um, I think there's a lot of connections, you know, for the past, you know, I would say, you know, even going back to 30 years at Tenement Square, it was really a lot of churches who made some of those connections possible, not just for people to escape, you know, uh, China to, through Hong Kong to the Western countries, but to create sort of this global network, even at that point, you know, before Hong Kong Watch was formed, before HKDC was formed, before there was a formalized advocacy, there was already a global network that was providing supplies, resources, communications. And so I think that there are a lot of those and utilizing particularly the, the you know, the church connections uh, as far as jugulatory bodies and, and things, but really finding the individual um, who are willing to step up. You know, there might be 
a bishop and a can somewhere, you know, an erector somewhere who's willing to say, you know what, this is something that I really care about. So I'm going to make those personal connections and really, uh, particularly in this case where we're now entering into a sort of an untested territory of Hong Kong being essentially closed down. And so the whole movement has to relearn itself about what it means to operate underground, to operate with a lot more risk involved. And so these then, I think, the soft networks of communities like churches becomes much more important and vital in the close down version of Hong Kong. So I'll, I'll pass it to, to, to Ben to say more about maybe specifically in UK, what can be done. Thank you. Um, well, I, I would say broadly there are, there are um, three things I think that uh, churches can do. Um, the, the first um, uh, is, uh, of course, <laughs> the heart of the church, the spiritual side, I think, praying for Hong Kong and making sure that congregations are uh, informed and, and are aware to then uh, uh, let that flow into action. But I very much agree with Samuel that there absolutely there must be uh, action. Um, uh, the, the words uh, in, in uh, the book of James um, uh, about the need to combine prayer and action uh, have always um, been, a, been a guiding principle for me. Um, so in terms of action, I think, firstly, uh, people can direct that action in support of uh, Hong Kong itself by joining with advocacy initiatives uh, and, and supporting by writing to your member of parliament, highlighting some of the advocacy calls. And then I think there's also action here on the ground for the growing number of Hong Kongers who uh, are coming and, and will come to the UK. And I'm sure Chris will have more to say about that uh, later. But just to say, I am involved with a, with a small new uh, charity that is about to uh, get off the ground. Uh, and there are other initiatives similar, but um, uh, that, that aims to be a, a port of call for Hong Kongers for their most practical needs, uh, accommodation and financial support and integration. And so I think the ch church can play a crucial role in, in welcoming Hong Kongers here and, and making sure they receive um, everything they need to, to settle here. Thank you. We are running a little late, but I think we can probably fit in a couple more questions if that's okay. Um, so we have a question from Neil Jameson who would like to know about the future of the Uyghurs and how the panel see their future and whether there's any solution um, to some of the challenges faced there. I guess there are some parallels in some ways in terms of what's going on there. Um, so first of all, Neil, it's, it's good to see you. Uh, I, I always uh, enjoy the uh, connection to the IAF uh, wherever I go in the world. Um, I, I, let me just start with, with this. I, I think that one of the uh, maybe unintended consequences of the rapid escalation of the Chinese policy on all fronts, including Hong Kong and Xinjiang and, and Tibet, is that they have made it very clear. That, I mean, they could have probably dragged on us, you know, as, as Ben was mentioning, you know, in the 2000s, many people was like, well, the one country two system seems to be working. Things seems to be pretty stable. People weren't paying attention. Um, Within this, the last 12 months, I think it became pretty clear that none of these issues and none of these uh, communities are suffering in isolation. That this is a systemic, nationwide, uh, global sort of suppression regime that is being planned and executed. And that, um, you know, in some way I'm encouraged by the fact that we're no longer sort of playing around sort of pre in pretense that like, oh, Hong Kong is a separate thing. You know, it's gonna develop in 2047 and see what happened after 50 years. In its own, it's about, you know, their own domestic terrorism. But I think that what we've been able to do as we connect the dots is to make clear that this is really about a connected systemic suppression um, an authoritarian regime. What that, I think for me, means that um, I, I think the Uyghur situation in a lot of ways, uh, I often say to our folks in our movement that, I mean, the, the, the circumstances and the, the suffering of the Uyghurs is much deeper and broader and, and, and really uh, outrageous compared to even what is happening in Hong Kong. Uh, but I think that what we've been able to do and what we must continue to help do is to now connect the dots and say that these are all connected, that our movements are connected, 
Hong Kong might get a lot more attention because, in some way, we're more strategically placed. We have more free information still flowing out. But we, it is our obligation to make the Uyghur、uh, communities and and the minority Muslims in Shenzhen as much in the spotlight as possible using the platform that we have. And so we had just talked about, you know, in the U.S. Here we worked on supporting the Uyghurs、uh, Forced Labor、uh, Act that、uh, now sheds lights on Western companies who are benefiting from the forced labor in Shenzhen. But but I think that that's why for me and for HKDC we see all of these initiatives, the targeted sanction that Ben mentioned, you know, that U.S. has been doing, the refugees,、um, immigration protections, and lifeboat protections. All of this, we don't see it exclusively just in the lens of Hong Kongers. We see it as all of those who are experiencing the same oppression, and I think that it is behooves us to continue to work harder to ensure to see that、um, the the connection between these movement is vital to us having enough strength to survive. Uh, and I think that right now, even today, I was just getting information.、Uh, we try to raise up the story, and I think that we need to continue to work and operate in the day to day as if we're、um, really a coalition、um, in 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 mission, but also in practice. And I think that taking in and highlighting the refugees, and 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 I even would broaden. I think that you know those of you who work as a practice will understand that the welcoming of refugees in general. Is part of this fight, and I think the more we can be inclusive in demonstrating that kind of solidarity and support and welcoming, the more likely that we can make progress in Xinjiang and the Uyghurs in Hong Kong and Tibet.、Um, so that's my my two cents. Yeah, I would like to add a few sentences on the Uyghur issue. Um, um, to me, um, I think the fight of the Uyghur people, Tibetan, Taiwanese, and Hong Kong, basically is the same fight. We are fighting against the totalitarian Chinese Communist Party. As long as the Chinese Communist Party is still ruling China. All the people living in China, or even outside China, like Samuel, would face dra- dramatic, uh, uh, a big、um, threat. And how we can, what we can do to help、uh, Uyghur people and Tibetan people?、Um, it has been、uh, reported that Chinese,、uh, the Chinese government、um, have been sending Uyghur. People to various factories to、uh, working for、uh, different companies. So it's, it's it's very difficult to distinguish whether a product made in China has been tamed by forced labor or not. What we can do is when we have a choice not to buy products made in China, just try. I know it's very difficult. I myself also have. A, a lot of Chinese products, but I have the awareness that when I have a choice there, then I will try not to buy Chinese product. I think this would be very effective to at least to weaken the economy of China, which is the source、um, for them to、um, uh, develop their surveillance system and suppressive system in China. Thank you. Can I just add very briefly a, a few seconds? I know we're over time, but、um, I agree with everything that Samuel and Ray has said. And the only thing I would add is、um, there is increasingly uh, um, more and more、um, suggestion that what's happening to the Uyghurs amounts to the level of genocide.、Um, and I've actually been involved behind the scenes in、um, an initiative、uh, that has now been launched, which is a,、um, called the Uyghur Tribunal. Uh, chaired by the British barrister Sir Geoffrey Nice,、uh, QC, who prosecuted Slobodan Milosevic, chaired a similar tribunal last year on the issue of forced organ harvesting in China, and he's now leading an independent tribunal. It doesn't have any official status as such, but、uh, a, a tribunal to to assess, based on the evidence, whether this amounts to genocide, and if it does, if if that tribunal's finding is genocide, or even if it stops short of genocide and and concludes. Crimes against humanity, then that really puts on 
the British government and other governments a, a, a real responsibility to do much more uh, than they've been doing. Um, there was a, a letter by 76 faith leaders last month um, highlighting this, this issue. And I would encourage churches, I know the focus tonight is Hong Kong, but since the questions have been raised, I'd encourage churches to do more on the Uyghur issue uh, uh, as well. Um, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, led that letter. And um, yeah, I hope churches will do more. Thank you. We have quite a lot of questions still coming in, but I think we're going to have to move on now. So I'm going to invite Krish Kindaya to tell us a little bit now about the work that is, he is doing supporting refugees from Hong Kong. Krish, please. Thank you, everybody. And it's been a privilege to be part of this conversation and uh, amazing. Just want to cheer you guys on on the panel for all that you've been doing. It's fantastic. Um, so my day job is to run a fostering and adoption charity called Home for Good. And you might be wondering, what's that possibly got to do with this Hong Kong situation? Well, uh, Home for Good was invited to take part in um, a kind of national response on refugees uh, way back when the Syria crisis hit. Uh, may maybe uh, your memories are good enough to remember that terrible picture of a little boy washed up on the beach, Ilan Kurdi and our nation, the UK, decided that we would take 20,000 unaccompanied asylum-seeking children over five years um, as our response to this um, picture and the, the cry for responding to the refugee crisis. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, let's just be clear. We, we took around 500 um, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. We took families, but not unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. But at the time, there was this sense that we ought to do something and Germany was willing to take a million refugees. Uh, we said 20,000, which looked which look very poor. Um, I've got this parenting technique where I try to catch my children doing something good. And I've decided that's gonna be my approach to political advocacy. I would love it if our nation committed to taking a million, but 20,000 was better than the zero that we said we were gonna take. Um, and it's when David Cameron, the Prime Minister then, said that this was going to be a modern day kinder transport, that something clicked in my brain. Uh, the kinder transport was when the UK took in 10,000 Jewish children in 1939, escaping from the Nazis. And I thought, well, hold on, where are you going to put all these kids? Um, you know, our foster care system doesn't have enough foster carers. Um, so where are you going to put them all? So we launched a little campaign, and in the course of a weekend, we had 8,000 people tell us that they wanted to help start the process to become a foster carer for an unaccompanied asylum-seeking child. And 8,000 people saying they want to do something is a politically significant number, and that got us a hearing with the government like we've never had before. So ever since that time, we've been involved in helping to mobilise the church to step forward to wrap around and support unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. And it looks like... Um, the, the um, democracy activists are not likely to be under 18s. So that's the kind of international standard to be a child. Some may be um, sixth formers and teenagers, but we're, see we're hearing the majority are probably student age and above. Um, but some are still quite vulnerable to come here in the UK and to kind of live alone. Our asylum and immigration system doesn't work very well. You've probably seen some pretty horrible stories of some of the places where young people get to live. Um, sadly, there have been suicides in those places. They've been, they've been so inhumane. I heard of one uh, bed and breakfast that had 90 unaccompanied asylum seeking people in it, uh, just stuffed in, really horrible situation. And we would love it if these uh, young democracy uh, activists who are fleeing to the UK for asylum would receive a really positive welcome um, and it's 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 complicated there are some interesting kind of uh, legal issues around uh, people that come uh, on a kind of tourist visa and then decide whether they're going to apply for asylum or not so we're just teasing out what this response should be but we'd like that response to be the best it can be we want to demonstrate the best of British hospitality and I've been particularly uh, impressed by the way that churches have responded to refugees in general. Um, and so we're looking to pull together a campaign that would activate the church well on this issue. Um, 
just to give you a little vignette what that looks like there was a young woman in the northwest uh, northeast of england who's a hong konger and has come to live in the uk and just off her own bat has started a kind of impromptu system of hospitality and she a single lady um, in her 20s has already found five Hong Kong has somewhere to live in her vicinity and the support she's able to provide. So we'd love to scale something like that. Um, so I'm keen if people would like to kind of find out more about what they can do, we're at the right at the early stages of this, uh, just drop me an email. I'm putting my email in the um, chat. Um, but if there's, that is a very practical thing we can do. And I, I applaud everything that's been said. But once you start to welcome someone into your home, and you begin to hear and understand their story, you become an even better advocate for them. Um, and so we see these this, this simple act of Christian hospitality as a wonderful way uh, that we can offer some very practical help to some pretty needy people. Just one last thing for me, there's a verse in the Bible that really sticks in my head. It's from Hebrews chapter 13, verse two. And it says this, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. But by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Wouldn't it be fantastic if you as a host had that opportunity to bless someone, help someone, but in the process be blessed? And wouldn't it be a fantastic signal to our nation and our slightly strange government at the moment on this issue of immigration and asylum that the church and individuals could step up, offer the kind of hospitality that people deserve as a kind of living witness of the grace and compassion of God? Thank you, Chris. I think that's a lovely and inspiring way to end um, the discussions tonight. Although I have to say that if you're waiting for our government to do something good in order to praise them, we might be waiting a little while. <laughs> Perhaps that's just my cynicism speaking there, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's, been, it's been truly wonderful to hear you all speak tonight and to hear the different experiences um, from different angles. So from someone who's been active on the ground, someone who's been working um, from abroad and Ben, who's had a kind of oversight of some of the international pressure and movement against that. So it's, it's been really good, I think, to get those different perspectives on what's happening. And I certainly feel better informed than I did at the beginning of this um, discussion about what's going on and a little bit about what we can do to help and hopefully bring some pressure to bear. So I hope that others feel equally inspired and I would like to give you know, my sincere thanks to all of you this evening for coming and speaking and to the audience for coming and listening this evening, because unless we can speak to you, unless we can spread the word about what's going on and about why we need to act in these cases, um, well, speaking to ourselves isn't going to do any good at all. So I hope that um, many of you listening tonight have been inspired by the words that you've heard and will be moved to act and to do something positive um, about what's going on. So thank you, everyone. And I will hand back to Vaughan to say a few final words, I think. Yes, just, just to say thank you uh, to everybody. As Bethany said, thank you to our speakers. Uh, especially thank you to Ben for helping uh, connect with our, our speakers. That's been extremely helpful. I feel this is the start of something. When I thought of organizing this meeting, I just had an idea that this was a really important topic that we should be connecting with. And it really is. I mean, it's just uh, really confirmed everything that I thought. And, and we won't stop here. If you, I know we haven't answered all the questions, um, if, if you want me to act as a, a go-between to any of the, the speakers and so on, just email me on church at unionchapel.org.uk. Church at unionchapel.org.uk. And I, I will facilitate anything. And I hope that uh, we can do something else because I can see from all the questions that haven't been answered, we've got to find some other space to, to follow this through. Um, so Ben, I'll be in touch. And uh, thank you again. Uh, thank have you a everybody. very peaceful night, a blessed night, and uh, plenty to do tomorrow morning. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Good night.
Oh,